Good morning. And welcome to worship today. What a beautiful morning, right? Oh my goodness gracious. Uh, my name is Pam Smith and I'm the pastor here at Grace Evangelical Lutheran Church in Lakeland, Florida. Um, and a warm welcome to those of you who are physically present with us, as well as those who are joining us through the wonders of the internet. Um, several announcements today. You'll notice several are on the insert to your worship folder, and I would ask that you um, take a look at those, take it home with you, and mark your calendars accordingly. Um, one of the things that you'll notice is that um, for, we're in the process of making preparations for music for the holidays. And so if you have an interest in singing in choir, I understand that there are some openings. And if you would like to be a ding-a-ling and ring a bell, I think that there are some openings. Now, this is important what I'm gonna tell you. The fact that you come for a month or two does not mean that you are signed up for life, okay? So, if you'd like to just give it a try, please come and join us for that. Um, today and the liturgical calendar is very significant. Um, it is Thanksgiving Pie Sunday. And so during our fellowship time after church, we have all manner of Thanksgiving pies in there to sample. And I even noticed that one somebody had written out the recipe for. So please plan on joining us after, oh, is that Barb? Thank you, Barb. Um, please plan, your favorite? Awesome. So Barb's favorite pie is the one that has the recipe card in front of it. <laughs> please plan on joining us. Also during our fellowship time, Brian Hype, who is our Thrivent representative, will be with us to answer any questions that you may have um, and to talk with us a little bit about charitable giving and how we can do that with um, favorable tax impacts um, to those who give. Um, a little bit of family update um, here. So, I think I mentioned last week that we had a lot of people who were ill, who were struggling, who were ailing, and so I wanted to give an update on some of that. Ken Gollenbach had been in the hospital with COVID, um, and he is now home and getting his strength back in his legs underneath him there. Um, Ann Calhoun had been in the hospital. Um, she has been discharged after a successful treatment. Ruth Nightinger had been in the hospital for an extended time and has now been transferred to rehab. Um, and there are others, of course, who have been suffering as well. One of the joys of being a community of faith together is that we can pray for and encourage one another. And so we remember these people and their families in prayer. Um, and now I'd like to invite James Irish to come up. James. As you may be aware, we're in um, our second week of our annual stewardship appeal. Our theme this year is Alive in the Spirit. And last year, last week, we heard Anna Cotton talk about welcome. And um, um, so our theme, welcome, nurture, praise is our, our theme. You'll see it out. And so James is gonna talk with us about nurture today. Um, hi, everyone. For those of you who don't know me, I'm James Irish, and I'd like to share a few words about how the church has helped to nurture me. In the months I've been in attendance at this truly amazing body of worshipers, I've been so welcomed, made so comfortable, and made to know I belong. Mm -hmm. I've never felt like I truly had a found family until now, as you all have become like my family in so many ways. From all the amazingly kind words that have been spoken over me by Pastor Pam, to the warm welcome as an official member two weeks ago alongside Mr. Richard and my sister Grace. I've been truly blessed to call, to be able to call this new found family, well, my family. Mm -hmm. um, I've never grown so much in the spirit as I have these past few months, and I can firmly say that I believe it is because of the wonderful, wonderful nurturing that you all, my fellow believers, have provided through the Holy Spirit working together. I am beyond blessed to call Grace Evangelical Lutheran Church my family, and just wanted to thank you all for the wonderful nurturing you've provided. You've nurtured me in spirit through the songs and lessons we all get to partake in. You've nurtured me in body through the wonderful times that we get to spend in the fellowship hall. You've worshiped, worshiped oh my goodness, no. You've nurtured me in mind through posing some wonderfully difficult questions to ponder. 
I can confidently say that Grace Lutheran has been a huge part in healing from some of the mental health issues I face, like depression and anxiety. The spiritual growth you all, through the Lord, have fostered in me have led me through some dark times. You all have been an absolutely amazing congregation to become a part of, and I am so blessed that you all have nurtured me so. Thank you all so, so much, and keep being the nurturing family that you all are. I've never felt truly at home until I found grace. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Oh, James, thank you. Thank you, thank you. The church in action, right? The church in action. Um, I don't have other announcements, and so I invite you then to join me in prayer as we sing Luther's morning prayer. With that, then, let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship.
Would you please stand and turn to face the baptismal font? Blessed be God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. O oh God of steadfast love and faithfulness, throughout time you have revealed your ways of justice, yet we fail to follow you. We are overwhelmed by the world's violence and suffering. We cling to what we have, afraid to risk it for the sake of others. For the harm we have caused, known and unknown, forgive us for the unjust demands that we place upon others and on your creation, forgive us. For the ways we turn away from you and from our neighbor, forgive us. Lead us back to you and set us on the right path for your name's sake. In the name of Jesus, our Savior, amen. Beloved in Christ, God's justice stretches beyond all that we can understand. God's compassion and mercy is beyond compare. In Jesus, God shows us a new way, and in him we are forgiven. Amen.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Righteous God, you own the earth and all its peoples, and you give us all that we have. Inspire us to serve you with justice and wisdom, and prepare us for the joy of the day of your coming, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for the readings. I will bring distress upon people, and they shall walk like the blind, because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood shall be poured out like dust, and their flesh like dung. Neither their silver nor their gold will be able to save them on the day of the Lord's wrath. In the fire of his passion, the whole earth shall be consumed. For a full, a terrible end, he, he will make of all the inhabitants of the earth. The word of the Lord. We will read Psalm 90 responsibly by full verse. Lord, you have been our refuge from one generation to another. Before 
you turn us back to the dust and say, Turn back, O children of, of earth. You sweep them away like a dream. They fade away suddenly like the grass. In the morning it is green and flourishes. In the evening it is dried up and withered. For we are consumed by your anger. We are afraid because of your wrath. Our iniquities you have set before you, and our secret sins in the light of your countenance. When you are angry, all our days are gone. We bring our years to an end like a sigh. The span of our life is seventy years, perhaps in strength even eighty. Yet the sum of them is but labor and sorrow, for they pass away quickly and we are gone. Who regards the power of your wrath? Who rightly fears your indignation? The second reading is from 1 Thessalonians. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers and sisters, you do not need to have anything written to you, for you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. When they say there is peace and security, then suddenly destruction will come upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and there will be no escape. But you, beloved, are not in darkness, for that day to surprise you will be like a thief. For you are all children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night or of darkness. So then let us not fall asleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep at night and those who are drunk get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober and put upon the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has destined us not for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up each other, as indeed you are doing. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you please stand? Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 25th chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. And Jesus said to his disciples, For it is as if a man, going on a journey, summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and I hid your talent in the ground. Here, have what is yours. 
But his master replied, you wicked and lazy slave, you knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have received what was my own, at least with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with the ten talents. For to all those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. You may be seated. Grace to you and peace from God and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, I said it the last three times that this parable has come up in the lectionary, and I'll say it again now. This is preposterous, simply preposterous, and I scarcely know where to begin. So once again, a few comments about the context of this parable. Jesus is speaking to his disciples. He's not speaking to the crowds who were following him. He's speaking to them as he is making his last trip to Jerusalem, where he knows what awaits him. And he's trying to, ooh, he's trying to prepare them for the challenges that are ahead. And the writer of the Gospel of Matthew includes these parables, some of which have not been part of our Sunday readings. The Gospel of Matthew was written many years after the life and death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus. It was written after the destruction of Jerusalem and the desecration of the temple in 70 AD. It was written to believers who were anxiously waiting for Jesus to come again and they were worrying that maybe all this is just a fool's tale. And in these words today and last Sunday and in next Sunday for that matter, Jesus is telling them what it is like to wait. Okay, that's the context. Now a reminder about that kaleidoscope that we take out when we hear the parables. We've spoken before about how a parable is not a tidy little allegory where every person and item has another meaning or identity. A parable is often understood as a, a riddle of sorts, one that we toss around in our minds to see what we may learn from it, what teachings it may offer, and what difference it may make to our life today as it made a difference to the lives of those who heard it the first time. So with that in mind, I tell you that one night this week, I kid you not, I had a restless sleep, likely in the early morning hours. You know those hours where you don't know if you're awake or asleep. In that restless sleep, I had slivers of a dream. A dream in which I was debating with someone, well, arguing actually, no, the master is not Jesus. Oh, yes, he is, replied, and back and forth. Now, like any good lawyer or debater, I could argue both sides of that question. But here is what I think and why. The master in this story is not to be understood as Jesus. And in my humble opinion, to do so leads to some very lousy theology and misunderstandings of Jesus. So why do I think the master isn't like, is not a, a figure or a type of Jesus? First, Jesus was not a wealthy man. He was not an acquirer of fortunes of millions of dollars. And Jesus does not head off leaving people alone to try to figure out what to do. And most certainly, 
does not put pass-fail tests before us. And Jesus is not a harsh man who reaps where he does not sow. That is, he does not take advantage of undeserved advantages. And as for throwing them into outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth, it doesn't sound much like one whose steadfast love endures forever now, does it? So where does this leave us? Let's start with the talent. A talent here is not a particular skill or gift. A talent is an amount of money, a very large amount of money. A talent was equivalent to about 15 years wages. And because I had to do the math, I went to the U.S. Census Bureau, and they report that the average annual household income of late is nearly $75,000. So, 75,000 times 15 years wages, a talent today would be over a million dollars. One talent, one. Five talents would be over five million dollars Two talents would be about 2.5 million, and one talent would be over 1 million. This was one very wealthy master, and one very confident, or foolish, to entrust nearly $10 million to his servants. Preposterous. And then, taking these sums from the master, millions of dollars, and then going off to immediately parlay them so as to double the money, what a windfall. Nearly beyond our imagination, isn't it? And then there's this third servant, the one who got one one who was fearful and uncertain, and he did what was perfectly acceptable in those times, kind of like tucking money under the mattress. He dug a hole and he put it in the hole and covered the hole over. But it wasn't enough even then, though it was the usual way of doing things. So here we are. Three people entrusted with tremendous, that is, preposterous amounts of money while their master was away for a time. Two took millions and doubled it and were lauded for their actions. One was fearful, and he kept his millions safe, returning it, to secu returning it secure upon the master's return, and he was scorned by the master. So what's happening here? What are we to learn? In fact, where's the good news? Jesus is talking about the end of time. He's talking about waiting for the end of time, talking about all things that are eschatological, to use the proper theological term. And this parable follows right on the heels of last week's about the 10 bridesmaids, five of whom left because they were self-reliant, doubting the care and compassion of those who they were waiting with, five who were foolish for their leaving. And in the telling of that parable, Jesus was telling his disciples, stay together, help meet each other's needs, don't give up. And today we are called to compare the first two servants with the third. What is the difference? Was it in the amounts entrusted to them? Well, yes, but that is a difference without a distinction. What was distinct is that the first two, upon receiving these vast amounts, set out eager and equipped and courageous. They took a risk, a pretty big risk at that, and they knew that it went against all that were the social norms of the time, but they did it. The third, presumably the weaker of the three, looked at what had been given him and was fearful of the master's judgment upon his return. And this third safeguarded 
what had been given, and in this he lost much. So what does this parable say to us today, to us individually, and to us collectively as a community of faith here at Grace? Like the parable of the bridesmaids last week, this parable provides an understanding of how it is that we wait. Wait for Jesus to return again. Wait for the inbreaking of the kingdom of God in our midst. Wait for that time to come when death and pain and crying will be no more. How is it that we wait? Last week's parable showed us that we wait together. We don't leave to go off and try to solve our problems ourselves. We rely upon each other. We stay close because there is enough to go around. So what does this one help us see? Think about these three servants and their relationship with the master. Can you imagine the look on their faces as they met with the master before his journey? Can you imagine their shock at what was being entrusted to them? Can you imagine what went through their minds as all of this was unfolding? We get a little insight from the parable itself. The first two went out at once in their eagerness to work with what had been given them. The third considered the master, saw him as a greedy man and a harsh judge, and the slave acted accordingly. Waiting. We've done a fair amount of waiting in these past few years, haven't we? We waited for a vaccine. We waited to take off our masks. We've waited for inflation to come down. We've waited for relief from gas prices. We've waited and postponed vacations and holidays, times together with family and friends. And to be honest, we've waited with varying degrees of patience over these past several years, haven't we? And now we are waiting again waiting for the return of Jesus, that blessed time when he comes to redeem all of creation unto himself, that time when death shall be no more, that time when pain and mourning and crying shall be no more. Oh, we long for that time. How do we wait? Are we like the third servant, fearful and apprehensive, clutching what we have, afraid that it may be lost? Or are we like the first two servants, amazed at the shocking sum that has been entrusted to us, eager to use it to further the master's business, and then joyous upon his return to give over to him twice what he had given us, and then humbled to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Yes, we wait gratefully, using that which has been given. We wait alive in the Spirit. Thanks be to God. Amen. <clears throat> Would you please stand as we sing?
We now confess our Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us turn our hearts to God, our breath and life, as we pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Gracious God, you give talents and gifts to all your people, and you equip the church to serve. Turn us from fear and self-serving ways that we use your talents to glorify you and to encourage our neighbor. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. You have been our dwelling place from one generation to another. Sustain the life of the planet, protect farmlands and harvests, direct all people in wisdom, stewardship of all the earth's resources. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You call us to honestly and with, uh, you call us to honesty and integrity to instill these values in the hearts of all nations and their leaders. Free any who are oppressed, expose all corruption, and bring redemption to victims of justice. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You teach us to count our days that we may be given a wise heart. Where there is sickness or sorrow, bring healing, particularly for Arlene, Anne, Mabel, Mike, Anna Mae, Doris, Caden, Michael, Julie, Carol, Anne, Lydia, Paul, Will, Amy, Betty, Bob, Jane, Marion L, Monica, Scott, Ron, Flo, Doris, Dottie, Ruth, Marion, Tim, Betty, Henry, Mary, Greg, Ann Joyce, Jim, Yolanda, and Max. And where there is loneliness, Reveal your love in community. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We pray for the faith formation ministries of our church. Give all children, youth, and adults who study your word the breastplate of faith and love. Shape us by your love and show us how to encourage one another. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Gracious God, you are faithful in all generations for the promise of life and rest and for the witness of those who have died in faith. We praise your goodness. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We offer our spoken prayers and those held in our hearts, trusting in your mercy, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. And now, my friends, may the peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. We share a sign of that peace with one another. We prepare now to receive our offerings as we return to God a portion of that which God has entrusted to us.
Would you please stand? Let us pray. God of power, God of plenty, God of abundance, all things are yours. We bring to you that which you have entrusted to us. Use them so that all may be fed. Shape us into the very body of Christ and use us for the sake of the world. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hands. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death in the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. indeed holy, almighty and merciful God. You are most holy and great is the majesty of your glory. <clears throat> you so loved the world that you gave your only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. We give you thanks for his coming into the world to fulfill for us your holy will and to accomplish all things for our salvation. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks and he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Remembering, therefore, his salutary command, his life-giving passion and death, his glorious resurrection and ascension, and the promise of his coming again, we give thanks to you, O Lord God Almighty, not as we ought, but as we are able. We ask you mercifully to accept our praise and thanksgiving, and with your word and Holy Spirit to bless us, your servants, in these your own gifts of bread and wine, so that we and all who share in the body and blood of Christ may be filled with heavenly blessing and grace, and receiving the forgiveness of sin may be formed to live as your holy people and be given our inheritance with all your saints. To you, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be all honor and glory in your holy church now and forever. Amen. Amen. 
My friends, we are bold to pray as our Savior taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. My friends, this is the Lord's table. It is the Lord who bids you welcome. We commune at the altar rail. After you have received the bread, the first chalice that will be offered to you is one for intinction in which you may dip the bread. The second chalice is the chalice for drinking. And the third chalice is the chalice of juice. Come, my friends, all is now ready. And may God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you and keep you now.
Thank you. Would you please stand? And now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, preserve us unto life everlasting. Amen. Amen. We give you thanks you, that you have set before us this feast, the body and blood of your Son. By your Spirit, strengthen us to serve all in need and give ourselves away as bread for the hungry. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Now I would invite you to join with me in the singing of our sending hymn. invite you now as you're able to move to the side aisles. And so my friends, as we are in this time of waiting, as we are in this time of anticipation, I bid you go out into the world and love radically. Love radically. Shower generosity abundantly. Shower generosity abundantly. Forgive extravagantly. Forgive extravagantly. Practice hospitality. Practice hospitality. Act compassionately. Act compassionately. Serve selflessly. Serve selflessly. Do justice. Do justice. Make peace. Make peace. Live simply. And may the blessing of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be upon you now and forever. 
Amen. Go in peace, serve the Lord.